Good job. What a friend we have in Jesus. You know, as uh, we're going to get started in this uh, lesson today, it's kind of interesting. Um, I've had so many distractions today, uh, different things, different people, different phone calls, all kinds of things. And I think the reason is I do not think that Satan wants this message today. I really don't think that uh, the devil wants you to hear what we're going to talk about t today. I don't know where you're at right now in your life. Some of you are going through some, uh, some deep waters. Um, we've been blessed with many things, but at the same time, we still live in a fallen world, and we have trouble. Some of you are very troubled right now, perhaps. Maybe you're listening, and you're going through some really dark places, but I want you to know that uh, you need not fear, and uh, you need not uh, feel hopeless. There's a passage we're going to look at. Uh, we're going to be finishing off in the book of Ephesians, in our study of Ephesians, very soon. I don't know if I'm going to get through all of the things I want to talk about today, but either this week or next week is going to be the last week in the book of Ephesians, our study. And we have seen so far in this study that uh, we have an, an amazing salvation in Jesus Christ. It was purchased on our behalf by what Jesus did on his work on the cross, and for those who put their faith in Christ, we have this wonderful new position uh, before God, right? And it's as adopted children, fully forgiven, heirs of heaven. It says that he has raised us up and he seated us in heavenly places. We really do have a very special position in God's eyes. And not only that, we are permanently indwelt by God's Holy Spirit. It's a wonderful promise. If you look in Romans 8, it says, How, However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. So if you're saved, God's Spirit dwells in you. It says, But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, spiritually dead, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness, his righteousness. Verse 11 says, but if the spirit of him, Jesus, who raised Jesus from the dead, dwells in you, who raised Christ Jesus from the dead, will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. This is what we have. We have God's spirit dwelling in us. And this is an important principle that we're going to come back to. But possessing this magnificent salvation that you have, we're talking about this for weeks on end. We've been talking about who we are in Christ, right? Being given all that we need to live this transformed life of power is still, now listen to this, it's still not a guarantee that you'll go on and succeed in the Christian life. To be saved on your way to heaven is not a guarantee of spiritual victory. I know that we assume that if you get saved, everything's just going to continue to go just swimmingly. Well, that's not the way it is. And why is that? I'll tell you why. Because we still need to apply these resources that we've been given. And we need to appropriate the resources that have been given to us in our salvation. So... As Paul kind of closes this letter to the Ephesians, he gives this admonition in verse 10 of chapter 6. We're getting right here. Listen to this verse here. It says, just a wonderful, powerful verse. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Paul is recognizing here that if we want to have victory in this Christian life, we need to employ our supernatural resources. It's not our might, it's God's might. It's his might. You see, until you get to heaven, you're still going to be in a battle. I don't know if you realize that. And the enemy, he's still out there and he seeks to defeat us. Not only is the devil out to get us, but guess what else? Our own flesh we sometimes can be our own worst enemy. It says the Bible and says it says that, that we uh, have another enemy other than the devil, and that's the flesh. The old nature, they, it joins up, it partners up with the devil and with this fallen sinful world, and it kind of like, I get gangs up on us 
lusting after the temptations that are all around. And if you're not on guard, this old nature was, is going to concede to your sinful desires instead of experiencing what is God's best. Satan and this world are out to get us. And sometimes we listen. Uh, but at the end, at the end, they always leave us empty, don't they? And so we need to really understand that we are in a war. It says in 1 Peter, uh, look at 1 Peter 5. It says that we need to be on guard because someone's out to get us. It says, be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. He's seeking to devour you. Listen, I'm telling you that that is the situation we're all in. Sometimes the, the battle is more intense than others. Sometimes there's a lull in the battle, but there's a battle nonetheless. And the reality is we're in a battle against a very powerful enemy. He's very dangerous. He's a crafty foe. So what does Paul say in the very next verse? Look what he says in uh, verse 11. He says, put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to what? To stand firm against the schemes of the devil. We have this, very, listen very carefully, we have this conditional promise given to every believer, and every believer needs to know this conditional promise. If you put on God's armor, you will be able to stand firm. But the, the condition is putting on the armor. <laughs> Why do we need God's armor? Because we are fighting against spiritual forces. Spiritual forces with supernatural resources as well. And we ourselves, we are just mere humans. So Paul goes on in the very next verse. He tells us who we're fighting. He describes it a little bit more. Look at, look at here in verse 12. It says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. So we have this, this clandestine enemy working in the invisible spiritual realm. We don't realize they're working behind the scenes to wreak havoc in our lives and to wreak havoc in the physical world. Satan, along with all of his many minions, his helpers, the other fallen angels, remember those? Those uh, who followed him and were thrown out of heaven at the very beginning? They're all working together, scheming day and night with this evil intent to do us harm and to undo us in our Christian life. This is so important. I want you to really grasp this. We need to recognize the real enemy. We need to understand that he is out there. And we don't want to underestimate what he's actually up, uh, what we are actually up against. Uh, the source of our problem, and this is the key, the source of our problem is spiritual. Satan and his army, it says, are a spiritual force. And their intent is on thwarting God's agenda. There's a vast assembly it says that there's principalities and their powers, world forces of darkness. It says that they are spiritual forces of wickedness. Did you get that? These are spiritual enemies. And Satan's whole purpose, the thing that consumes him day and night, is to oppose God and to oppose God's people and to stop his work from going forward. So God wants us to be aware of his presence. That's why Paul is writing this. He doesn't want us to be oblivious. He wants us to be attuned to just how dangerous Satan can be. We really shouldn't uh, trifle when it comes to Satan. We need to be prepared to defend against the attacks that he's going to bring. And that's why we need to put on the armor of God. Because we need to protect ourselves against what? Spiritual attacks. And this armor, well, guess what? This armor is spiritual armor. And it's been provided to us by God himself. And if, if we don't have spiritual armor, we cannot win. Because we need, if we expect to withstand the enemy's onslaught, we need spiritual resources. 
He said, put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm. Three times in this passage, three times Paul repeats this admonition to stand firm. He doesn't want us to wilt like a wallflower. Look what he says in verse 13. Therefore, he's like, this is a strong admonition, this passage, isn't it? Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Are you in the evil day? Are we in the evil day? Listen, we're, we're always in a battle, folks. The battle's always being waged. But there are times, I can tell you this, that there are times when Satan decides to pick your number. And guess what? He says, today's the day I'm going to attack you. And he's going to try to throw everything at you. You know, I think of that classic story in the Old Testament. Remember Job? Remember Job? Satan aimed his whole arsenal at poor old Job. I mean, he attacked his family. He attacked his wealth. He attacked his marriage, tried to divide him with his wife, and, and even his health. He took it all from him. He stripped him all, all in an attempt to do what? To shake his faith. He said, surely he's going to just deny you, God, if, if you take all those things away. If, 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 I were to, if I were to inflict these type of things, he will curse you, God. He used the heavy artillery, didn't he? And that's exactly what he did. And, and, and he did it in an attempt to, number one, to discourage, and then finally to defeat Job. And don't think it can't happen to you, because you're going to face, maybe you haven't yet, but you're going to face some intense battles and attacks in your future. Some of the things that are going to happen to you are going to rock your world. And they're going to shake you, perhaps, to the very core of your being. You know, I think we're going to have a wonderful tribute to Joel, but that was really a shock to my system to lose my deep friend, Joel. And, uh, you know, those are the kind of things that make us grasp for answers. Perhaps it's the loss of a child or the betrayal of a friend or maybe it's the infidelity of a husband or a wife. Those are spiritual. Did you ever think that these events could have been orchestrated by spiritual forces behind the scenes? Did you ever think that they were involved in any way? Could it be that there were demonic attacks going on and you didn't even realize that they had some hand in this? I'll tell you, we, we know as Christians a theological truth. We know that demons cannot possess a Christian. I believe that demons cannot possess us. We have the indwelling spirit of God. But they can sure create a whole lot of havoc in our life to try to defeat us. Demons still are working to defeat us. Even though they've lost our soul, they want to make us ineffective and useless for God. They want to defeat us so that we are uh, totally out of the picture in this spiritual warfare that's going on. So when you and I face these attacks from the enemy, when we're under the heavy fire from the, as it calls it, the flaming arrows of the enemy, when, when all that's coming in, this is not time to panic. This is not time to run. This is time to, to, to stand firm, right? This isn't a time to back down or give up. We need to hold our ground. We need to dig in. We need to, as Paul says, we need to stand firm. We can't allow ourselves to be caught off guard. That's why he's warning us here. Instead, we need and we should expect and prepare for the attacks of It's losing it. I got it back. All right. We'll have to check that out. I'll keep my hand out of my pocket. <laughs> so how are we going to be prepared? Well, we need to get dressed for battle. That's what he talks about. Let me ask you, look at these pictures. Which guy do you think is more prepared for battle? This guy on the beach? You think he's ready for battle? He's looking ready. He's looking relaxed, I'll tell you that much. But is he ready for a battle? How about this one over here? How about this guy? 
Which one do you think is more prepared for a battle against the forces of darkness? I'll tell you, I would rather have that guy on my side than the other guy with the sandals. And by the way, guys, never wear sandals and flip-flops with socks. It is a cardinal sin. You do not do that. So Paul says what? What does he say in his passage? He says, put on the full armor of God. Put on. He's going to list for us six very important pieces of armor. These pieces of armor are essential, and he wants us to make sure that we are garbed with them. And I have to ask you, are you wearing these pieces? The first two are found in verse 14. Let me read verse 14 for you. It says, stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. So the first piece of armor that he mentions is truth. Girding your loins. We see this picture of, of like a belt of truth, some versions say. The belt is what holds everything together. Truth is the one concrete, unalterable, objective reality that we have in life. It's the standard by which we measure everything else. Do you know there are such a thing as absolutes? And it is the foundation if we want to properly understand our world and what's going on. And when things come at us, we'll be able to interpret those things because it's based on truth. So is it any surprise that one of Satan's favorite weapons is what? Lies. Satan is the father of lies, and if we don't know the truth, we're going to be deceived. Jesus said, uh, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Truth is the safeguard so that we can see when Satan is coming against us. And Satan is going to try to defeat us with lies. That's his number one weapon. That's the thing that is the easiest thing that he can get to use against us to cause us to stumble. I'll tell you, if we don't know the truth, then we are going to miss out. God's word, right here, it's the source of all truth. So when something happens, you can compare it to Scripture. And then you can ask the question, who are you going to believe? When the world starts to spout views that contradict the Scriptures, we can be confident that this book, the Bible, is where we find truth, and we know where we're going to rest our, our authority and, and we're, what we're going to rely on. It's right here. You know, I was talking to a monk in Greece and he was talking about how he had based his beliefs and his faith on the traditions of the church. And I said, well, I base my beliefs on the word of God. And uh, when it came down to it, when push came to shove, he was very clear that he believes that the traditions of the church are more important than the word of God. Well, you don't have a basis there. And Satan loves that because now we have shifting sand based on whatever the latest opinion is from man. Mankind is fickle. They change their views all the time. God's word is unchanging. Satan cannot deceive you if you're grounded in the truth. The next one, spent a little extra time on that one, but the next one is he, he talks about righteousness, right? The breastplate of righteousness, right? Back in uh, Roman days... Uh, the Roman soldiers, they had a breastplate, and it covered them both front and back from their neck to their waist. I mean, when a soldier put on this breastplate, he was covered. And when the devil comes along and accuses us, we need to remind ourselves that we're covered. You know what? We need to remind him that all of our sins were under the blood, and we have Christ perfect righteousness. It's been imputed to us. God says very clearly that God's righteousness has been credited to our account. That is an amazing thing to know that we are clothed, it says in Corinthians, with the righteousness of Christ. We have God's righteousness that is, that is our protection, right? And one of the, one of the greatest things in the world um, is knowing that we are, are seen in God's eyes 
as perfect. When God looks at us, he doesn't see our sin. He sees Christ's perfect righteousness. And not only that, but here's the wonderful thing about it. Once we receive God's righteousness, it says that he gives us his grace, and his grace is given to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. That's in Titus. It's a wonderful thought to, to realize that not only does God save us and give, you, give us his righteousness, but then he empowers us to live righteously and to be righteous. This is the armor that God has given to you. And I'll tell you, one of the great protections we have in spiritual warfare is when we live empowered, victorious, righteous lives. When we dabble in sin, guess what happens? When we dabble in sin, we give Satan a little foothold. He gets a foothold into our life. And if we keep on sinning, he gets a stranglehold on us. And then we become defeated. So... We have truth, we have righteousness, and then we have this wonderful thing in verse 15. We have the gospel. Look what it says here in verse 15. And having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You know, you need to have your feet covered, right? And the the thing that covers us, the thing that covers our feet is the wonderful message of the grace of God. The gospel. The gospel of peace. A clear understanding of the gospel. If you don't understand the gospel, then you're going to be easily deceived. The gospel is what prepares us for battle against the enemy. He seeks to cause chaos. But when we are grounded in the truth of the gospel, you know that word there, preparation, for the, with the preparation of the gospel. This is the only place that word is found in the whole New Testament. So it's a little obscure. It's not sure exactly what he's saying, but we, have, we can be ready, we can be prepared with this wonderful gospel of peace at all times. You should never take your shoes off, by the way, if you're in a battle, right? You want to have good footing. You want to be able to stand firm. The Roman soldiers used to have like little studs coming out of the bottom, like cleats. Just I guess they must have invented cleats, but they had these little nails coming out of the bottom of their feet so they could really get good traction. They wanted to make sure they could stand firm. I'll tell you, when we have the gospel, that's that's what's our anchor for truth. That's the anchor. And and, and God says that as we have that, we can be strong in what we believe. It's like Paul said, I am not ashamed of what? The gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation. We can have confidence because, why? Because Our salvation is secure. The gospel is the one piece of armor that we should always be wearing everywhere we go. It should be on our lips at all times. Do you know, if you notice those first three pieces of armor that I mentioned so far, these are articles of of spiritual clothing that we need to wear all the time. They should never really be taken off, right? We should clothe ourselves with truth and righteousness and this beautiful gospel. And I love how he describes it as the gospel, specifically what? The gospel of peace, right? What did Jesus say? This is what you get. You know, the enemy wants to cause chaos, right? But Jesus said, these things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation. But take courage, I have overcome the world. Jesus said, I came to bring peace. I came to, be pre, to, to give you perfect peace. The gospel is offered by the Prince of Peace who supplies us with his peace. It's a peace, that, it's a peace that passes all understanding, knowing that my salvation is secure in Christ. Isn't that wonderful? I can go to sleep at night. I don't have to worry. I don't have to worry about what's going to happen. I don't have to worry about the dreams. Because why? Because I know who I belong to. And I know who's holding on to me. There's a wonderful verse we should all know. It's Romans 5.1. It says, it says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have what? We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The moment you put your faith in Christ, you're no longer his enemy. You're at peace with God. And when you have peace with God, you will experience the peace of God. And when you have the peace of God, 
There's nothing that the devil can bring your way. You can be calm under chaos. You can be uh, secure in knowing where you stand in Christ. Um, when, when you have peace, you can just about put up with anything, right? Then he goes on, he says another one. He says, talks about faith, right? He talks about faith. In addition to all these, taking up the shield of faith, which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. So all these other pieces, we have this, this shield of faith he talks about. Faith is likened to a shield. It is our shield. You know, there are times where you only have faith. It's easy to trust when you can see a way out. It's easy to trust when everything falls into place. But when, you trust, when, when you're talking about faith, it's trusting God when you don't see the answers. When you just say, okay, Lord, I don't know how you're going to get me out of this, but I know you're going to get me out of this. I don't know why you want me to do this, but I'm just going to do it because you're telling me to do it. And I can trust that your ways are best. It's faith versus fear. That's really the, the options that you have. You can either live in fear and say, I can't do this because all of the reasons I can give you and the rationale reasons why I can give you, for instance, not going to church, I can give you 20 good reasons while all of the wonderful people tell you it's not a wise thing to go to church. But I know that. I have a God of, of, uh, of all the universe, an all-powerful God telling us that we should not forsake the assembling of ourselves together with believers. So who am I going to believe? That's where it takes faith. I'm going to trust God. I'm not going to trust the doctors and the lawyers and the cop politicians and everybody else who has other agendas. I'm going to trust in my Savior. Faith. Faith versus fear. Faith believes, listen to this, faith believes the promises of God when we are under attack. Promises such as this, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Or promises uh, like this, what then shall they say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Do you believe that? God says that he is our shield and he is our defender. He is our refuge. Do we believe that? Those are the promises of God. It's wonderful, isn't it? So when, when we're tested, then we have to say to ourselves, will I trust in God? There's two other pieces of armor. Verse 17 says, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. Two more mentioned. The first one is salvation. We already have touched on this some, but the helmet... There's, there's this, this concept that I think is really important. Once you do know you're saved and you're secure, you have hope, right? You have hope. There's a hope about the future because you know where you're going. And I think it's wonderful to know that we have the helmet of salvation protecting us. And then with the last one, the sword of the Spirit, which is what? Again, God's Word. Like I said, one of Satan's favorite lies is to tell us, guess what? You're not good enough. That's one of the lies he gives us. Maybe you have heard that lie from him. He tells, he tells you that God could never love you after all you've done. Maybe he's telling you, he's whispering in your ear, he's saying, you're so bad, God could never forgive you. That's one of the lies that, uh, that he throws out there, or that... You can't really be sure if God has forgiven you or not until you get to heaven. That's what, that's what uh, the devil would like us to believe, is you never can be certain if you're in or out, or if you're good enough, or if God will accept you or if he won't. Those are all lies. This is what God says. Psalm 103 says, The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. God doesn't hold grudges. It says he has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness towards those who fear him, to those who trust him. And then look at that wonderful verse. You should all 
write it in your Bible with highlights and markers and circle it as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. That's what God said. Satan says, oh, no, he, he, uh, you're not, you can't be. So. It's like God is holding us under probation. That's not salvation. When Satan talks, he talks about it as if it's probation. We are completely acquitted. Now, God will never again mention our sins. Or jump to Isaiah 43, 25. I, even I am the one who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake. I will not remember your sins. That's wonderful, isn't it? I'm so glad. I don't want to remember my sins. I, I don't want to remember my sins, and I don't want God to. And then he, he repeats that in the New Testament. In, in, in Hebrews, he says, For I will be merciful to their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. Isn't that wonderful? God's not going to bring up anything. He, and Satan would like you to think he is. Satan would like you to feel like you're always under God's thumb. And you're always just a little bit short of his standards. Well, we're all short of his standards. But because of Christ, we are now in Christ. We are now fully accepted in the beloved, it says. So when Satan comes along, accusing us, trying to confuse us about the grace in which we stand... We can combat him by throwing the word of God back in his face. I would recommend when you start feeling these thoughts, when you start getting these kind of like ideas in your head, I'd recommend that you, you know, you just actually speak the word of God. I think you should just quote the scripture, go on the offensive, just like Jesus did. Remember when Jesus was tempted? What did he do? He quoted scriptures right back at the devil, the scriptures. The word of God says this, Satan, you know, and that's exactly what we should do. I think we need to be reminded constantly that we are in a spiritual battle. And guess what? The battle's going to be more intense as the day draws near to Christ's return. It's going to get tough. Jesus is coming back, and Satan, he's doing everything he can. He wants to rob us of our spiritual blessings that Christ has provided through his wonderful work on the cross. And so we need to be on guard. We're going to talk a little bit more because there's one last important element. What activates? What is the catalyst to all this? And we're going to talk about that next week. <laughs> so you have to come back, all of you. It's going to be great. But this is important because we need to be able to be victorious because there is a spiritual warfare going on. And I'll close with this last thought. When it says put on the armor, you know, there's another passage in, in Romans. It says we need to put on Christ. Put on Christ. You know, Christ is the embodiment of this whole armor. Christ is truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Christ says that he gives us his righteousness. He is the one righteous son of God. He also said, not only is, is he true, and not only is he righteous, but what's, that, what's the next one? What's the next one of the armor? Peace, the gospel of peace. He's the prince of peace. And then it says uh, that Jesus, we talk about Jesus, he is the word. It says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. You see, Jesus is our armor. If you can't remember the pieces of the armor, just remember you've got Jesus. And if you've got Jesus, then you have the, all you need for spiritual victory. Just remember that. And if you don't have Jesus, then you need Jesus. So if you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, he says, why don't you just trust in my wonderful work on your behalf? You could not save yourself, so I died in your place as your substitute. And all I'm asking you to do is to trust in that. And if you'll just put your faith in my son, Jesus Christ, you will have eternal life. You'll be forgiven of your sins, and you'll be forever victorious. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for this passage. And I know that there are many people who feel defeated, but I pray, Lord, that we would claim the victory by faith 
um, and put on this armor that you've given to us. Remind us, Lord, of who we are in Christ, what we possess. Arm us, Lord, with your, your truth and your righteousness and your peace, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you would give us um, all the things that we need that pertain to life and godliness. I thank you for that, Lord. And if there's anybody who's never trusted you, today is the day that God is looking for you to en enlist in his army in this spiritual battle. And I pray for that in Christ's name. Amen. Yeah. Jump up there right away. <laughs> <laughs>